welcome to Windows on Worship. My name is Carl and it's wonderful to have you with us today, especially if this is the first time you've ever tuned into Windows on Worship. You're very welcome. This week we're going to be thinking about what it means to follow Jesus in a post-truth world and the importance of heeding prophetic voices, voices that really challenge us, wake us up, make us think, both within the life of the church and beyond it. Before we get started, if you've not done so already, you might like to download your worship sheet for this week. You'll find the link to do that just below the video in YouTube, though you might need to click on show more in order to reveal it. On your worship sheet, you will find the order that we're going to be following and some prayers for us to say together as we move through the act of worship. You'll also find some red YouTube icons. These indicate suggested videos designed to accompany the main video. You may wish to watch these by interspersing them with the main video, perhaps using a separate tab on your browser, or by coming back to them later on and using them to help you to continue to reflect and ponder and pray throughout the week. On the reverse side of the sheet, you will find the jukebox playlist which is this list of suggested videos. It's also available in the playlist which accompanies this video. A link to that will pop up right towards the end. Or you could go to the Windows on Worship channel page and scroll down to the bottom. There you'll find all of the suggested playlists. Finally, turning back to the front side of your worship sheet, you'll also find some blue computer icons. These indicate places where you might wish to share your thoughts and comments and prayers with others. You could do that either in the main comments section for this video or by using the live chat function in YouTube, which might be particularly helpful if you're tuning in to the premiere of this video. So we begin our worship with our opening prayer, which really draws us together in all our different places before our God. You'll find the words for this on the worship sheet. And if you want to join in those words in bold type, either in your head or out loud, as we move through this act of worship, please do so. So let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So having come together before God, we now bring to God our prayers of adoration, our prayers of praise, which are again on the worship sheet. And this week they're taken from Psalm 89, specifically verses 1 to 4, and 15 to 18. So let us pray. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name and your righteousness all day long, for you are the glory of their strength by your favour our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Glory to you to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. We come now to our prayers of renewal. These are prayers which give us space to bring to God those things in our own lives that we want to say sorry for, and also those things where we've been hurt by what's happened to us. 
There are also prayers that acknowledge that sin isn't just something concerned with individual lives, it impacts the whole of our world and the way things work. And these prayers offer space to bring those things before God too. So let us pray. God of costly and life-giving love, who bids us come and walk the way of the cross, we bring to you those things in our own lives and within the life of our broken and messy world in need of renewal and restoration at this time. We bring to you those things for which we are sorry, restore us and heal us. We bring to you the burdens we carry and the sorrows we bear, restore us and heal us. We bring to you the brokenness and oppression in our world. Restore us and heal us. We bring to you the times that we've hidden from the risks of love. Restore us and heal us. And we bring to you the failures of the church to stand for justice. Restore us and heal us. God of costly and life-giving love, who bids us come and walk the way of the cross, thank you that you forgive us, restore us, and send us out to be bearers of hope and justice and to bring new life for our words and actions. Amen. On Windows on Worship, we like to suggest a weekly craft activity. This week, we're going to be thinking about, as I've already indicated, prophetic voices, those people who speak to us of God's way, God's way of seeing things, breaking into the present moment and challenging us. So you might like for a craft activity this week to think about who you think those people are that we need to listen to and heed as prophetic voices. See if you can find maybe some newspaper cuttings about them or stories off the internet and make something of a photo montage out of those cuttings and, and printings. It may be quite a helpful discussion starter if you're thinking more about today's readings. Today we have two readings, firstly from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 28 verses 1 to 9, and then a few verses where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and that's Matthew chapter 10 verses 40 to 42. One day, in late summer of that same year, the fourth year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, Hananiah, son of Azur, a prophet from Gibeon, addressed me publicly in the temple, where all the priests and people listened. He said, This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says, I will remove the yoke of the king of Babylon from your necks. Within two years, I will bring back all the temple treasures that King Nebuchadnezzar carried off to Babylon. And I, was, <clears throat> and I will bring back Joachim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the captives that were taken to Babylon. I will surely break the yoke that the king of Babylon I will, has put on your necks. I, the Lord, has spoken. Jeremiah responded to Hananiah as they stood in front of all the priests and people at the temple. He said, Amen. May your Lord, may your prophecy come true. I hope the Lord does everything you say. I hope he does bring them back from Babylon, the treasures of this temple and all the captives. 
But listen now to the solemn words I speak to you in the presence of all those people. The ancient prophets who precede you and me spoke against many nations, always warning of war, disaster and disease. So a prophet who predicts peace must show he is right, but only when the predictions come true can we, can we fully know that he is really from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He who receives you, receives me, and he who receives me, receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man, because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth. He will certainly not lose his reward. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Sometimes, friends, there is a big difference between what we want to hear and what we need to hear. Within this, the role of the prophet is to speak truth, but we don't always wish to listen. In his famous poem, The Wasteland, the poet T.S. Eliot noted that human beings can't bear too much reality. We struggle to face the facts of ourselves and the complexities of life as it really is. Ultimately, we struggle to face God, because there's no deceiving God as to the human condition and the state of the world. So thus, in the culture of Eliot's day, and indeed in ours as well, much energy gets directed into distractions and deflections, and even into persuading ourselves that what we anxiously want to believe is in fact the case, despite all the evidence to the contrary. The prophet's task amid all of this is to cut straight through all these layers of self-deception and corporate delusion. The prophet's task is to jolt us awake and bid us come and open our eyes to the way things really are. As an example of what this is all about, there's much interest these days in what one might loosely call spirituality, which is reflected in the content to be found within the mind, body and spirit sections of many bookshops, should you fancy a spot of non-essential retail. However, much of that vast output seems to me to be geared either towards furthering material ends or the pursuit of inner peace, in inverted commas, as if spirituality is simply about an individual feel-good factor. Contrast that rather fluffy idea with Rowan Williams' description of Christian spirituality as that which interrogates us rather than us interrogating it. Rowan talks about it being that which strips us naked before the reality of God. And so the contrast is huge. The former notion easily becomes about being self-absorbed, self-centred, inward-looking, whereas the latter demands being ready to lose one's life in order to find it, letting go in the process of pretense and distractions and daring to face the truth. One is very easily put down should it become too hard or costly. The other, in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, bids us come and die. In our Gospel reading for today, Jesus has been preparing his disciples to hit the road and go about proclaiming the Kingdom of God to the lost sheep of Israel in words and actions. And here he talks about opportunities taken to walk in the way of truth and the rewards thereof. Talking about righteousness points towards the faithful keeping of the law of Moses. And holding this emphasis on righteousness together with talking about profits and profits rewards reminds us that Matthew is especially keen to show us how Jesus fulfills both the law and the prophets. And there's something here about hospitality in an echo of the parable of the sheep and the goats. If you give the least of my followers a cup of cold water, 
you do the same for me, and ultimately for God the Father. In a week that's seen something of a heat wave, the idea of being given a lovely chilled cold cup of water sounds rather nice. But what of these rewards that Jesus speaks of? Exactly what is the prophet's reward? Well, if we look at the Old Testament prophets, the answer might not actually seem all that attractive from a worldly perspective. Jonah was somewhat unique among the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures because he wasn't killed for his trouble. And we know that Jeremiah, the part of whose story we heard about in our Old Testament reading for today, would go on to meet a rather sticky end. Indeed, God bids us come and die. Jeremiah's rival, Hananiah, didn't see it that way though. After all, it's far easier and more profitable for oneself to tell people what they want to believe is the case, despite all the evidence to the contrary, especially within a context of great anxiety. See, the court of Judah was beset with worry amid the threat that, like Israel had previously, they too would be conquered by a more powerful nation, and they were fearful of being dragged off into exile by the Babylonians. To get his point across that this was the inevitable consequence of having departed from God's ways, Jeremiah had placed a symbolic yoke around his neck. But Hananiah broke this in order to spread false hope. Perhaps Hananiah said and did what he did because he really believed he was speaking God's word and like many a televangelist today, if he happened to profit through playing on fear and need, well, so be it. Jeremiah, however, embodies a very different kind of spirituality. He would love to have been able to speak words of hope and new beginnings. But unfortunately, in that setting, they simply would not have been true. The proof of the pudding is going to be in the eating, he says. And if, Hananiah, you're really proclaiming the word of the Lord, then what you say will come to pass. In this exchange between the two men, Jeremiah is slicing through that veneer of spiritual authenticity created by his rival. This wouldn't be about what the people wanted to hear, but about what they needed to hear. And it meant Jeremiah's reward would not be one of fame or status or material wealth. God bids us come and die. However, as Jesus alludes to within our gospel reading, the rewards in heavenly terms are worth walking this difficult path of reality amid worldly unreality. So what are we to make of all of this? How is any of this good news in a post-truth world? Well, friends, these readings are undoubtedly and inarguably very challenging. They point towards the cost of authentic discipleship. However, we're also reminded that to encounter and welcome one speaking God's truth is to welcome Jesus. And the good news here is that we cannot exhaust our opportunities to turn towards and embrace God's love in Christ Jesus. This does mean facing up to the truth of ourselves and those ways in which our world fails to reflect that love. And that might feel like rather less than encouraging an experience. Jeremiah, back in chapter 20, spoke of a fire burning in his bones that he couldn't ignore. He had to face the truth. However, doing that also means coming to see the realities of our God. And that is always encouraging. That is always good news. So who are those prophetic voices that we need to heed today? Well, for me, they're people like Greta Thunberg and David Attenborough, who couldn't be more different on one level, but who have both in their various ways called the world to account about climate change, which is still a huge crisis facing our world as much as this time of lockdown has given our planet some much needed breathing space. How we return to economic activity without also returning to harmful ways is a big question, but we cannot simply ignore the message of Thunberg and Attenborough. 
They're two people who are ready to speak the truth, even when this makes them unpopular with leaders who would prefer to ignore reality and instead listen to modern day equivalents of Hananiah, insisting that every little thing's going to be all right. And if it isn't, well, God's going to destroy the earth anyway. So with all of this, I'd like to leave you with a question to ponder. Who do you think are the key prophetic voices that we need to hear? And how does their message align with the values of the kingdom of God? Amen. So we come now to our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. Let us pray. God of truth and hope, God of reality, we bring before you the situations and people and places that are in need of your transformative and radical life-giving love today. We pray for all of those who have been impacted by systematic and overt racism in our society. For those who have received unjust treatment at the hands of the police. For those who are still suffering from the injustices meted out to the Wimbrush generation and their children. For those who are fearful to walk the streets, for being stopped and searched simply because of the colour of their skin. And we pray for all of those who have been subjected to violence, intimidation, bullying and discrimination simply for being who they are. Lord, we pray that you would shine a spotlight on injustice, particularly racism in our society and its institutions. Help those of us who need to change these things to recognise unfailingly and unceasingly how things have been shaped in a way that disadvantages others and give us the courage to face up to these things and bring about lasting change for the good of us all for when one part of your body suffers all suffer we pray for those who are particularly struggling in the midst of continuing lockdown and those who are anxious about how things will unfold as restrictions are lifted. We pray for all of those who are yet to be reunited with their loved ones. Those who are just desperate for a hug and human contact. We also pray for those people who are anxious about emerging out of isolation or staying at home for a long period. For those who are struggling with how all of this has affected their mental well-being. And for those who are worried about how they're going to keep their businesses afloat and maintain their livelihoods. The Sunday on which this video premieres is in the middle of the Methodist Conference, the Methodist Church's decision-making body. And so we pray for the meeting of the conference. We pray that its deliberations would be guided by truthfulness, by an acknowledgement of the reality of things as they are, rather than as we would like them to be. We pray that we would interact with one another with love and respect, but that what would emerge would be genuine hope for the future, that we might be once again remoulded and reshaped into a church that proclaims the love of God in all that it says and all that it does, tackling with honesty and courage those aspects of its life and its outreach that fall short of that. Lord, we pray that you would give us a renewed vision of your righteousness and justice and that when others 
come to us in righteousness and with prophetic words that rather than turning them away we would welcome them and nourish them we pray for all of those who are bereaved at this time for all who have lost loved ones during this period of lockdown whether from COVID-19 or for other reasons and particularly those who have not been able to say goodbye to their loved ones as they would have liked. It's hard to imagine the pain of not being able to be by someone's side as they die. And Lord, we pray that you would bring comfort and strength to all who find themselves in that situation. We pray for our NHS staff, for all those key workers who continue to keep us going, and for those who face having to make difficult decisions in balancing risk in the days ahead. Finally, in a time of quiet, we bring to you those particular individuals and situations on our hearts today. And so we bring all of our thoughts and prayers together in the words of the family prayer that Jesus taught us. We say this in whatever version or language is most familiar to us, and either in our head or out loud as we feel most comfortable. So let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to today's Windows on Worship. I hope you find this act of worship helpful. If you'd like to keep in touch and to be alerted by YouTube when a new video comes along, please hit the subscriber button that will pop up towards the end of this video. As I said earlier, there is also a jukebox playlist that accompanies this video that gives you other things to look at to help you in your praying and pondering and thinking throughout the week. A link to that will also pop up at the end of this video. But for now, a prayer of blessing. God of truth, God of reality, you bid us come and walk the way of the cross, for it is also the way of light and life. Be with us and strengthen us as we do so, and may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be upon us and all whom we love and pray for now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.